Okay, so I figured I'd backtrack from about to move into uh, acidity and nitrogen and how the nitrogen cycle adds acidity to our soils. Um, so I was speaking with some students and they're like, yeah, you know, it's been a minute since we went over that. Like, it'd be good if we could get that solid. Because I just handed y'all a piece of paper and said, good luck. Let me know what you know. And then I just went off into this. Bleh. So again, much like in soil and water, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we all have the understanding of some of the processes that go into the nitrogen cycle. So um, the soils people who got it last semester, uh, this is going to encompass everything that goes in there. So we're going to go by, we're going to go through each one of these processes step by step so that we can learn and understand um, where the where the acidity is going to come from and the processes inside of this nitrogen cycle that go in with our six um, types of reactions that we study in soil chemistry. Can't mention anything about nitrogen without mentioning the 4R um, nutrient stewardship, which is the right rates, right time, right source, and right place. And I'll make sure that I post these notes after this. I didn't get an opportunity to get in and get a student version because I was at my house working at 9 o'clock. I looked up and I was like, it's 9.03, oh crap, I got class in 27 minutes, I better hurry up and get there. Um, but anyhow, just that we have the right fertilizer source and that we're applying it when our, new, when our plants are going to need it, or we put it close to our plants so that they can get it. Uh, this is important for nitrogen and phosphorus. And then finally, that we're not over applying our fertilizers. Uh, many of us are aware that nitrogen central molecule is, is central to the uh, chlorophyll molecule. Uh, the majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen, um, and it plays this role in some other amino acids um, and enzymes and whatnot. Uh, and in plants, that's where we see the green from, that's where plants get their growth. Uh, mobile in the soil and the plant. Uh, when we have deficiencies, uh, you'll, see the, you'll see the deficiency in the older tissues first. If we apply too much, we end up getting some lodging, which is going to decrease our yield. So we want to get that right balance so that we can, um, we can keep our plants up so that our combine can drive through and get this. Combine's not, no point in even being there because you're not getting any of that off the ground. Uh, so there are two plant available forms. We have ammonium, NH4 plus, and nitrate, you know, three negative. And so, the reason why this is important is that, that, that our soil pH is going to influence which one of these two plant available forms is taken up. And so uh, in lower soil pH, we will have this root exchange with hydrogen because the plant is going to release a hydrogen into the soil so that it can take up one of these ammoniums. And then in uh, pH soils, we will have an exchange with uh, carbonate or a hydroxyl that is going to increase our soil pH. So in more acidic soils, we'll have more ammonium and the plants are going to take that up greater because uh, when we go over volatilization, you'll see that when we have this hydrogen there, it remains attached to the soil. And when we make it, when we finally get to nitrate, we have a negative, it's an anion, and so it's not adsorbed to the soil as well. Now, I just put some information in here. This is from soils uh, that, you know, most of the organic nitrogen uh, is going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> long and the short of that. Many of us are aware of the uh, hypoxia zone. All right, we're going to go through this nitrogen cycle pretty slow. There are about nine fates to the nitrogen cycle. And I wonder if I've got this. Cool, I do. So if you can look and see, there's a number associated with where we're going to be in this, hey, in this cycle. 
So number one is going to be fixation. And that is going to be biological and atmospheric. And so for soybean, we apply, uh, we add a inoculant to the seed before we get planted. And the, the rhizobium is what fixes the nitrogen, forms that symbiotic relationship with the plant, and then is able to fix the atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a plant available form. Next, it can undergo mineralization. And just remember that mineralization is a transformation of organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen. And so ammonium and nitrate being inorganic, our amino acids being organic. Next, can undergo nitrification or be taken up by the plant. So during these processes right here during this mineralization we'll, we'll go over when we get to the nitrogen cycle it undergoes aminization and then ammonification and that's where we get the ammonium part from and then it can undergo nitrification so somewhere between the mineralization and nitrification we now have our plant available forms that can be taken up by the plant next is immobilization and so if the carbon to nitrogen ratio is greater than 20 or 25 to 1, the microbes then need the nitrogen that's in the soil in order to decompose the carbon substance. Whether it be crop residues or whether it be some other uh, leaf material, uh, some sort of plant material that contains a lot of carbon. And then finally, well, down at the bottom of your cycle, nitrate leaching can be leached out through the soil and that has a lot to do with the soil structure and texture and things of that nature. It can be fixed in the two to one clays and if we go all the way back to cation adsorption when we talked about um, illite being able to fix the potassium in between its layers it can also fix the ammonium as well. And then finally on the left side we have ammonia volatilization and then finally denitrification. We're going to go over those processes. Uh, so, right here, we have fixation. On the right side of the diagram, we have fixation. It's a whole new different uh, subset that, that, that's more um, soil microbiology and how that works. We're not really concerned too much with that. Next, right here, and I, I'm not crazy about the way that they, um, the way that they blocked these out with this mineralization and immobilization. I tend to keep those together uh, because they are constantly happening back and forth. That carbon and nitrogen ratio changes between here and there. Um, we'll undergo this aminization. and then ammonification. So maybe from all the way back into organic chemistry, NH2 being an amine group. Not too concerned about the R on that. That's, that's the other part that makes that molecule up. So we have fixation, plants can, uh, have, microbes can take it into, uh, from organic into inorganic through these processes that can be taken up by the plant. Um, any other uh, organic nitrogen source will have to undergo mineralization before the plant can take it up. Uh, this is just kind of going over the process where that happens, not that you're going to need to know how to write any of these formulas out, but just to understand that we have organic matter that has proteins in it that must undergo this aminization in order to get to an amine group which can then be oxidized. There's water. We finally end up with ammonia.
Once it becomes mineralized, then it undergoes several of those other phases, being plant uptake. It could volatilize into the atmosphere. We will get some change in nitrification, or it could be immobilized by the microbes. So each time we do one of these steps, the other steps apply to it as well, because it's a, it's just it's a, a chain reaction down. And these are the phases. Next. We undergo nitrification, where we go from ammonium that is oxidized to nitrite, two I's, and then further oxidized to nitrate. There are two species that are responsible during this nitrification process. The conversion from ammonium to nitrite is by the nitrosomonos, N-I-T-R-O-S-O-M-O-N-A-S. Hopefully I have that in the slide, I'm sure I do. And then finally from nitrite to nitrate by the nitrobacter species. Once it becomes nitrate, what do y'all think the fate of nitrate will be? It can be leached out, right? It can be, what else? Oh. Through a different process. Okay. Technically, that's a correct statement. But it's a different process. It's not the volatilization process. The volatilization happens up here. Okay. Okay. So, again, once we, so it can be leached out. What is a, is it a plant available form? Nitrate? Yes. Yes. So it can be taken up by the plant. Next, it can be immobilized by the microbes. And so this is where I had that big long equation drawn out on the board where we went from ammonium to nitrate to understand that when we have oxygen, which type of reaction do you, do you expect it to be taking place? A reduction or an oxidation? A what? A reduction. A reduction with oxygen. Oxidation. An oxidation. Real quick to think about that. If there's oxygen, probably going to have an oxidation just like rust, right? If there's no oxygen, we would have a reduction. And so, which type of environment do you believe this is? An aerobic or anaerobic environment? Aerobic, because we have oxygen. So, aerobic environment, likely to be an oxidation. Anaerobic environment, likely to be a reduction. Um, so we undergo this process, and you know, I drew this all the way out, right? Remember, I went from NH4 plus to NH3 to NH2 to NH to N2, and it just kept on going all the way down. So somewhere in between getting from ammonium to nitrite, there is a change in four hydrogens. Remember, oxidation, it loses. So we've lost four hydrogens between here, like, right? Because we've got four hydrogens right there. We don't have any hydrogens here, so they had to go somewhere. We lost those four, and this is what increases our soil acidity. During this process, the release of those four hydrogens is what causes the soil acidity. We'll add some water and some energy out of that, and then this will be continued to be oxidized because nitrite is actually toxic to plants. So this conversion this conversion happens moderately, but this one has to happen very quickly under oxidized conditions because uh, plants don't like nitrite. They like nitrate. So nitrosomonas species, also known as ammonia oxidizing bacteria, ammonium 
with oxygen gets us to ammonia. We had an oxidation, we lost an ion. Well, I mean, we lost a hydrogen ion. Now we're at ammonia. These bacteria take over, convert to nitrate. I mean, nitrite, I'm sorry, nitrite. At that point, they're done. Nitrobacter comes in, cleans up the rest, and finally oxidizes it to nitrate. Um, a couple of the things that we need um, in order for nitrification to happen is going to be ammonium. So it has to get to ammonium before nit nitrification can happen. The reason this is important with nitrate, um, as, again, it can be taken up by the plant, it can be immobilized or lost to, to the environment because it's very water soluble. And if you remember from our anion um, adsorption strength, it's kind of near the end. So it has that high, it's got a large hydrated radius to form inner sphere or outer sphere complexes. Outer sphere complexes. Wait a minute. Likely to form outer sphere complexes because it has that water around it, right? So it can be adsorbed. What about phosphate? Inner sphere or outer sphere? Inner sphere. Inner sphere, right? So you can think about that as we move towards this other end that is held by inner sphere. Because remember, those oxygens will form a covalent bond with the outer edge of that clay layer. Very good. Um, so this is a real big thing back in like the 70s and 80s. Um, blue baby syndrome. Uh, Moms were drinking water that was contaminated with nitrates and nitrites. And when nitrate is in the blood system, it wants to take more oxygen. And so the babies didn't have enough blood to supply that oxygen with them. So their mouths turned blue. And mom, you got moms freaking out all over the country going, how come? Well, come to find out that there was nitrate, excessive levels of nitrate in the water. So the EPA sent a maximum contaminant level of 10 parts per million. So here we have our nitrate leaching, or it can be ran off. Back to our right rate, right time, right source, uh, cropping intensity, and then also irrigation and rainfall. So someone's going to talk about uh, variable rate fertilizer applications, and then you're gonna come behind with irrigation. So we apply just a, a lot of nitrogen, but we don't care, we just, that's the way grandpa did it. And we're gonna apply 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and then we're gonna water it in, and then it rains, and then this leaches out. Now you don't have that nitrogen in the soil anymore. And you go, how come I applied 200 pounds of nitrogen and I didn't get a response? The nitrogen cycle is where you should start. Well, what were the conditions? What was your pH? How much did you apply? Where did you apply it? Remember immobilization, inorganic, immobilization to organic. Um, and this is gonna be based on carbon to whatever element um, is in question, whether it be carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphorus, carbon to sulfur. Uh, and remember all of this carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are all part of those biogeochemical cycling processes that give our um, soils the nutrients of it, the nutrient availability for our crops. If it is held as ammonium, remember it, it is fixed into those clay layers or can be fixed in clay layers. And so we apply ammonium fertilizer, we add water in a smectite type clay, illite. It's going to swell. The ammonium will adsorb to the tetrahedral and octahedral layers in between the clay layers. And then when the water dissipates, it sucks back down and traps that ammonium into the soil. 
And so when you ever get to, when we say, oh, I applied 200 pounds and nothing happened, why? And you get to all of the, well, let's look at the pH. The pH was right. Well, let's look at the water, the rainfall. The rainfall shouldn't have been a problem. When you look at all these other things, it's possible that it was just fixed into the clay layers. And that's where kind of knowing what your soil type is going to help you be able to determine these types of things. To kind of go, oh, you know what? No wonder we got some smectites and we got some illites in there. Uh, so it's possible that it can be trapped in between those clay layers. Back to, once ammonium is in the soil, it is not likely to volatilize. It is possible that it can volatilize, but it's not likely because it will be held to the soil colloids rather than uh, being influenced by the soil pH. And so we can have this volatilization where ammonia, ammonium, Transfer is transferred into ammonia and then volatilized into the atmosphere. So if you're applying granular urea, 200 pounds to the acre and your producer says, hey, you know what? I don't know what happened to my nitrogen. First thing you should ask is, what type of fertilizer did you apply? You applied granular urea, you applied it broadcast and it didn't rain. Well, guess what? It's gone. Have any of y'all ever seen like your rea have y'all seen your rea fertilizer just sitting on the ground like on the concrete or any fertilizer type sources like it starts to melt. Yeah. Okay? It's because it is hygroscopic. H Y G R O scopic, which means it's going to absorb some of that water. It has a natural affinity for that. And so whether you add water or not, that urea hydrolysis reaction is happening. Now you want to add more water to make it happen quicker and you can get that into the soil profile. So um, that's one of the first things you're going to ask is what fertilizer did you apply? You applied granular urea, you applied a broadcast, you have a lot of crop residues and you didn't water it in. Well, it probably volatilized. It never even made it into the soil. So our goal is to get it into the soil where it can be held to the soil colloids it might undergo some of those other reactions. It might undergo nitrification. It might undergo immobilization. But it could also go from immobilization back to mineralization and start all those processes all over again. But if we get it in the soil, we've got a better chance of keeping it in the soil or the plant. If it's lost to the atmosphere, we can't get that back. Even though we got some N2 fixation, this has to undergo several different reductions once it gets into the atmosphere it has to be reduced or oxidized back to into gas I want good here for ammonia volatilization remember we um, in the equation when we went from urea to ammonium, we required two hydrogens from the soil. And if we take two hydrogens away from the soil, what does that do to the hydroxyl concentration? It's more acidic. It, the two hydrogens into the soil? We took two hydrogens out no, of the soil. More alkaline. It becomes more alkaline, correct. And so that's where this comes in. And remember, we're always trying to get back to that equilibrium, much like our functional groups of organic matter, We've got to get a hydrogen from somewhere. So the hydrogen dissociates from ammonium to form water and this ammonia gas. That's probably the simplest way. And y'all, this is no different. This is no different than pH dependent charge. It's the same concept, except this was a functional group of organic matter. And we had a hydroxyl in solution and we needed to get a hydrogen from somewhere. So we took it from that functional group of organic matter. Um, once this, this is a gas, and now we have gas dissolution and our volatilization, and now it's not in the soil. Poof, into the atmosphere. Again, like I said, I am gonna post these as soon as we get out of class. 
But these are just some of the conditions that you can look at. And this is probably online somewhere. I'm sure if you looked this up on Google, you would find it. Um, so you apply granular urea and your soil pH was eight. Large hydroxyl concentration, pH is through the roof. Where is it going to get the equilibrium from? The ammoniums. We're going to need some rainfall. Look, and here's our CEC. Mill equivalents per 100 grams is no different than centimoles and charge per kilogram. Did we look at that? Do y'all remember seeing that in when we look, just looked at CEC? Just, that was just the basic unit, centimoles to charge per kilogram. So on kaolinite, this low risk on smectite or vermiculite or anything above 15, and then we also have that ammonium fixation, right? So if it's trapped in between the clay layers, it's not going to volatilize. At least it's there. At least it's not in the ditch. Um, Here's our ammonia, I mean, here's our urea molecule. We have some ammonium sulfates, carbonates, and uan. Um, we can't get ammonium nitrate anymore. So that one's out. Um, and maybe anhydrous ammonia. Next, we have this denitrification. So again, we're trying to get back to, we're trying to get that nitrogen back to the atmosphere. It has to, it has to go in a cycle, right? Most of them do. And so during this process, during this process, we are anaerobic. What type of process is occurring? Reduction. A reduction, because we are anaerobic. <coughs> and so we are losing or gaining hydrogens, but only back to N2. <coughs> um, they have this set up a little not kosher with, um, and when I draw on the board here in just a moment, we'll see why. If at some point in time, if at some point in time it begins to rain, let's say we've made it all the way through this and we have nitrate, right? At some point in time, when it starts to rain and fills the soil, it becomes anaerobic. There's no more oxygen. And so unless this process is complete by the time the water dries out, we're going to get a different gas that's given off, primarily this N2O, which is 300 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. And everyone's all freaked out about carbon dioxide, right? So we're adding these molecules back into these nitrous oxides, back into the atmosphere that is causing greenhouse gases. And so what I wanted to do, I was hoping that someone would pick this as a topic. Um, during my master's, I took soil and water conservation, and the professor had me do this. Y'all remember me mentioning it was just a ditch and wood chips. And so what they were doing is they were applying, they, were, they had a, a microbial population of Pseudomonas that is responsible for this process, and they added wood chips, which is a carbon source, which means they require something from the nitrogen. They require an electron. And so during that process, they added the chips and they made sure that the the environment stayed anaerobic and then this process was completed and then they just released the water out the ditch so like a retention pond where they used this reduction process to purify the water rather than send it through some waste treatment plant and have reverse osmosis or some hydride membrane or some some very super expensive energy consuming process. So like soil chemistry gives us the ability to think about the processes that go on in the soil and how we can manipulate the environment to reduce or oxidize a certain material so that it falls out of whatever system or suspension or solution that we're dealing with.
much like I mentioned, 300 times greater. Again, I do not like the way they drew this hole. I don't like the way they. And again, I tend to try and follow from the book. And I'll show you all why. I'm going to bring that down just a little bit. Oxygen. What is the... What is the... Oxygen is worth how many? Positive or negative two? It's worth positive two? Negative. Negative two. And how many oxygens do we have? So that is negative six. What is the valence state of nitrogen? Plus because we have a negative right here. Yeah. We have the negative, it's negative one, so nitrogen is plus five. Oxygen is worth negative two. We have two of those, negative four. One right there. So what is the valence state of nitrogen? plus three, because negative four plus three equals negative one. Why are we trying to get it negative one? We're not trying to. It this is the this is the charge, this is an anion. Okay. Nitrate is an anion. It's just there's an extra electron somewhere and that's what gives it the charge. Just like ammonium there's an there's an extra there's an extra positive charge somewhere, and that's what attaches it to the soil. But see, we don't have a negative charge here. Yeah. The charge is balanced. So this doesn't, this, this isn't, it's neutral. So the oxygen is worth how many? Two. And how many do we have? Two, so four. So is it positive or negative four? Positive. Oxygen is worth how many? Two. Positive or negative? Negative. Negative. How yeah. many oxygen? <laughs> You're right. Keep going. So well, oxygen is worth what? Positive or negative four? Negative four. Negative four, correct. And our charge is zero. So what is nitrogen? What is the valence state of nitrogen? Four. Plus four, correct. It's four minus four equals zero. How about here? Two. Positive or negative? Positive. Oxygen is worth negative, negative two. Negative. negative two, right? So what is the valence state of nitrogen? Two. Correct. What about here? Negative two. We have negative two, we have a zero here. So what is the valence state of nitrogen? It is one, very good. And there's two of those. So the valence state is technically plus one, and we have two of those. What about here? I got a clue. It's zero. Okay, zero. The valence state is zero, right? And so that, that molecule looks like this. So maybe you did great right here. You got it. Oxygen negative two. That's the very first place you start. Then you look to the charge and then just subtract until you get to the charge. What about this? I'm gonna do two of these. And then let's do valence state of oxygen. Negative eight, right? What is hydrogen? So it's one, but there's two of them, so that takes up two of the charge. What is the valence state of phosphorus? Let's see. Or, or no, plus five. Plus four. 
<laughs> Nate's just like, I don't, I don't trust in them. <laughs> negative eight and plus two is negative six. The overall charge on the molecule is negative one. So negative six plus five equals negative one. Phosphorus is plus five. Does that make better sense now? Yeah. All right, how about over here? What is the valence state for oxygen? Okay. How many of them do we have? So that's negative eight. Let's just think about this. The charge is negative two. Somewhere in here, we're looking for plus six. What is the valence state of hydrogen? Two, one. Plus one. What is the valence state of phosphorus? Five. Plus five, correct. Very good. And that's all it is. Oxygen first. Once we get to oxygen, then we can look to our charge negative two and we knew that we needed plus six in order to make that equal and, and eight negative eight plus six is negative two sure i mean you're getting it dude awesome job <laughs> we got the n2 said i don't know <laughs> So what does knowing those valence states help us? Like, how does that help us? It helps us understand whether it's an oxidation or a reduction process. Okay. That was the purpose of doing that, is that when we go from one, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move everything up and we'll all go back to it all the way again. What's that? I said and all of those are reductions, correct? Correct. I know it looks janky because we're doing this. I'm gonna go right back to it and we'll start from NH4, we'll go all the way to in a three. the reason why I didn't like the way they wrote that down. Right, we have, this was negative four. So the valence state of nitrogen has to be plus three, so we get negative one. Then when we go over here though, there's no charge on there's no charge on this nitrous oxide, but the charge for oxygen would be negative four. Therefore, if it's balanced, this needs to be plus four.
hydrogen plus one times four. I'll write this up here. Plus four. Plus one. What's the valence state of nitrogen? Positive five plus positive four equals or negative five. Negative five. The overall charge. The overall okay. Negative three. Then. So you yeah. yeah. I said it, and then you repeated. I was like, wait, wait, wait. Negative five or positive five plus positive four plus nine. So we need to find the hydrogen or the oxygen first. The hydrogen. Well, I'm just saying, like you need to find one or the other. In order to figure out the valence state of the or the oxidation state, they're kind of used interchangeably. Um, so the valence state is plus one, and we have four of those, therefore the overall charge is plus four. <coughs> therefore, the oxidation state of nitrogen would be negative three, because the overall charge is plus one. What about here? Plus three. Plus three for hydrogen. What about nitrogen? here for hydrogen plus two what's the valence state of nitrogen negative two, negative two equals zero how about here plus one. hydrogen is plus one what is it? And this equals zero what is the oxidation state of nitrogen negative one how about here zero zero well done oxygen worth negative two What is the valence state of hydrogen? I mean, of nitrogen. Is it plus three? It is plus two. Sorry, it's plus one. And we have two of those, right? Zero. They're not here. Negative two for oxygen. Nitrogen? Plus two. How about here? Negative four for oxygen. Nitrogen is? Plus three. adding oxygen. We're, in order to get from ammonium to nitrate, we need oxygen. And when we have an aerobic environment, which process are we expecting to encounter? Oxidation. An oxidation. And when there's oxygen, there's going to be an oxidation, just like rust. When you leave it outside and it's wet and there's air, 
oxidation. Oxidation, it loses electrons. Negative to positive, meaning it, it being the nitrogen. We go from negative three electrons to negative two electrons to negative one, and now we don't have any electrons. We made it here. We're neutral. There are no more electrons. Now we're becoming more positive. Oxidation loses electrons, meaning we're becoming more positive. Reduction, it is going to gain electrons, which means it's becoming more negative. Oxidation, it loses. Look, we went from negative three to negative two to negative one to zero. This is center. For plus one, electrons being negative, protons being positive. Plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. So we've lost electrons. When we reduce, we're going back the other way, where we're gaining electrons. Reduction it gains because we're losing oxygen. There's no more, look, oxygen is becoming less from negative six to four to negative two to negative two to zero. So it's the oxidation state of nitrogen that becomes more positive when it's oxidation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Because it lost. It lost electrons. It lost electrons. Exactly. The oxidation state of nitrogen lost electrons and became more positive as it gets oxidized and it has to because of the oxygen right oxygen's negative two and so the more oxygens that we have the greater the valence state of the nitrogen needs to be in order for that molecule to form and so we can only get we don't even have a, a negative two anywhere in here there's not enough electrons for there's not enough electrons to be given up for nitrogen. But we do have Notice that there's an extra hydrogen here. And when our soils are acidic, the, the constant, the hydrogen concentration is greater. That's why, that's why there's the extra hydrogen there. In alkaline soils, it's not. But we still need to have this charge. Phosphorus is four. Five, and this is six. But the charge is too negative. And so you can just look for that you can tell by how oxidized it is. This is oxidized. Because the oxygen has a negative two charge on it. Like there's more oxygen, there are more electrons in the oxygen than there are for the rest of the molecule. So very oxidized. Uh, start to get reduced. Start to become more positive. Start to become more positive when we reduce. the overall molecule becomes positive. So yes, have I confused the crap out of y'all? I hope not, man. Like, it confused the shit out of me when I was doing it. Like, wait, what? Because that's the same question. Who cares? Why do you care? And he asked it several times. What is the change in the valence state of nitrogen during the nitrification process? I'm like, what? Who, what? Oxygen, it's nitrate, like why? But it, it, this drives home oxidation, it loses electrons, and that the change in the nitrogen, the valence state of nitrogen, loses electrons. And that when it's reduced, it gains electrons because we're removing the oxygen. So it's a, it's a charge thing. And so that's how we can tell whether or not we're reducing or oxidizing. And how do we go about changing oxidation states? If there's oxygen, what kind of environment do we have? Aerobic. And if we have a reduction, a reduced environment, what kind of environment? Anaerobic. All based on this oxygen supply. 
So when we're going to try and figure out well, how do we get this out of the soil or out of the water, can we oxidize it and it changes? Can we reduce it and change it and adsorb it to some material like soil <laughs> or some membrane or something? But to understand that oxidation it loses, reduction it gains. And so when we know how to do this, we can start to apply that to other things. So once you know, once you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. Once you, once you get a, a, a better understanding of the nitrogen cycle, especially this process, the rest of chemistry becomes really easy. And that's why I've spent, I'm gonna spend some more time on it going over it, making sure that you know it. Because once you do, the rest of it's just gonna be like, oh, duh, it's negative two, it's negative four, it's plus six. Like, it won't even, you won't even think about it. The light bulb came on for another student in last semester's class, and it took you a lot sooner <laughs> to understand the concepts than it did him. We took two weeks to get this, but when the light bulb came on, he said, oh, I got it now. And he did. So this to say that during this, uh, this is ultimately, this is in the nitrification. this is technically not a modification. Technically this process is modification. And so when we go from an amine to ammonium, which process do we have? Reduction or oxidation? If we go from an amine to ammonium, this is part of the mineralization process of organic matter, is it oxidized or reduced? Reduced. Reduced because we lost or we gained electrons. So the organic matter, it has to undergo some reduction. So there's a process that the microbes are doing. <clears throat> this process being denitrification that happens under anaerobic conditions. So we're removing these oxygens to the Santa Rosa. No more oxygen left. Trying to get to this process. So it rains, you, or you apply fertilizer, it rains. We undergo this ammonification, the urea hydrolysis. We have nitrification, and then it rains a lot. There's no more oxygen, and your soils stay wet. They're saturated, it's anaerobic the microbes will begin to take these electrons. And so we will get a reduction. If somewhere between here, your soils dry out, these are gases. These two right here are gases. Well, technically this is gas, but this is gas. If, if it dries out and we have oxygen now, and there's a path of evaporation, of volatilization, those three will volatilize into the atmosphere. So denitrification technically is a volatilization process. You will have, it has to volatilize up into the atmosphere. Um, but that's much different from this being That's much different than this volatilization, okay? But they are technically, the processes are some vapor movement upward. Good? Is that becoming more clear? Mm -hmm. Slowly but surely, it, man, it takes time. It just does. 
that you can ask Michaela. Once we understood this, once the nitrogen cycle was figured out, everything else is a piece of cake. So y'all did, did this in fertilizer. Yep, oh. sure did. And so that's where that's where I had to, um, and I had to take a step back and go, you know what? When are we ever going to use this? Who cares? Right. And so I think that as we move forward, I don't know if y'all are going to take fertility. I don't plan. So you don't plan on taking fertility. You're about to graduate, and you probably aren't going to take fertility. So like, I might just go back over the kind of the science of the fertility side, since I had the opportunity to make sure that y'all get some information as you move forward. Like, I come from Mississippi State, so they're like, man, we're about to get into the lab and start doing some desorption processes and some calculus and some trig and all this other stuff. What for? Why? We're not going to do that. I don't care about doing the biohuckle. I've never calculated ion concentration activity or none of that stuff, and it's not going to apply. This stuff will apply though. And so I may make it to where you either you take fertility, which is the application of fertilizers and nutrient deficiencies. And if you're brave enough, you can come back in and we'll go over the actual chemistry aspect of these fertilizers. So y'all bear with me. I'm in the process of kind of going, I thought I was about to go teach soil chemistry. And then I get in and I go, they don't care about soil chemistry. I go, oh, I may need to back up a little bit and readjust the class. And so that's why I went back to the nitrogen cycle. So because once you understand this and you get a really good grasp on it, everything else just falls into place. And you're like, oh, that makes sense. It's, it's, it, it's just like the reduction when we have nitrogen. And you can always relate this back to the nitrogen cycle. I do it all the time. Because this is beaten to my brain when I took fertility. And it was beaten to their brain when they took fertility. So I'm gonna kind of sidestep on this whole chemistry thing and make sure that I'm covering more of the fertility. But to understand that when we understand, when we know oxidation and reduction processes, we can start to manipulate the environment to remove these chemicals from water or soil or wherever it is causing a problem. So I guess that probably like I guess the direction that I had for soil chemistry was that at some point y'all will use oxidation and reduction to change the valence state of some chemical, some molecule, much like absorption goes this way. Because the valence state is plus four. So we're starting to get well, this would be like an inner sphere complex. Inner sphere complex. 
inner sphere complex. They're held more tightly to the soil and they're in a reduced environment. So it's losing electrons. This is a reduction. So when I have selenate and I reduce the environment, I'm trying to get to elemental selenium that's held to the soil. This will now fall out of, it will be adsorbed. So here I have this tank. I've reduced the environment. The selenium has now been adsorbed to the soil, come out of solution. I can release the water and add more water back and this soil will continue to reduce this environment and the selenium will be adsorbed to the soil. So it's like a, you can think about it like a magnet that I'm attracting all of these negative or these um, contaminants and pollutants and chemicals and things that I don't want in my water to the soil like a magnet. Let the water run out, hurry up and make sure that I flood it again because this can be oxidized when I add oxygen to the soil and it will move back this way. And now I have the same problem that I had when I started. So keeping an environment reduced is one way that we can remediate things. And so I think that by the end of this class and going in with the other class, y'all will be able to give some presentation to them that describes more of one of these processes. And when you can teach it to someone else, that's when you don't. But y'all are doing great. You've got it. You've got it. It's positives and negatives and just have to know that oxygen is negative too. And that the valence state is going to be, or the overall charge, zero. And if I know hydrogen is plus one, I have two of those. The valence state has to be negative two. Killed it. All right. That's enough for today. We'll see y'all in an hour.